Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, this is National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune, and I would like to welcome you to today's broadcast of the NCC WSC Climate Change Science and Management Webinar Series. This series is held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Today's webinar will focus on the topic of breaking traditional barriers to model climate change and land use impacts on freshwater mussels. Our speaker today is Thomas Kwok, leader at the USGS North Carolina Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. We will introduce Tom in just a minute, but first I'd like to remind you of a few logistical details. Currently, all of your phones are on a global mute and they will continue to be so for the duration of the presentation so we can hear Tom. After the presentation, we'll open up the conference for questions and I'll give you instruct instructions at that time. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Emily Fort, Data and Information Coordinator for the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. Emily, would you please introduce our speaker? I'll be happy to. Thanks, Ashley. And um, we're really excited to have Tom to here today to talk about his work. Tom Kwok has served as a leader of the North Carolina Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit and professor of biology at North Carolina State University since 1999. His interests and expertise are in the ecology and management of stream and river communities with an emphasis on fish and fisheries. Much of his work has been in identifying physical and biotic influences on the ecological success of aquatic fauna at different spatial, temporal, and organizational scales and quantifying such relationships. Tom mentors graduate and undergraduate students and has taught university courses in fisheries techniques, ecology, and management, including restoration ecology. He is active in a number of professional societies, especially the American Fisheries Society and the Freshwater Mollusk Conservation Society. So we're very happy to have Tom here and we're excited to learn. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, Holly, Emily, and, a and Ashley, for uh, all your help in setting this up. And I think I'll switch to full screen. And thank you, everybody who's online listening and looking at the slides. And um, uh, I think the webinar today uh, is very appropriate with all the budget cuts and especially all the snowstorms throughout the Midwest and the Northeast U.S. So. Um, I'm glad you were all able to attend by phone from your home or your office or wherever you may be holed up through the snowstorm. Um, well, the, the talk I'm going to present today is about breaking traditional barriers to model climate change and land use impacts on freshwater mussels. And, and the first barrier broken was to uh, team up with a lot of different collaborators from around the country spanning academia and agency. and um, it's very rare to have about 12 authors on the title slide, but in this case, everybody really contributed in different ways to the project to make it a success. And, and I would argue that by working together on a single funded project through the USGS and the South Atlantic LCC that we were able to learn much more than any one of our groups could individually. So we have um, collaborators from USGS, North Carolina State University, University of Wisconsin at La Crosse, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Park Service. And I looked around in my book of quotes uh, to so sort of sum this up with some very uh, insightful quote and didn't find one. So last year when we started presenting our results, uh, around different uh, conferences, the FMCS meeting in particular, um, we wrote our own quote, and it was, to achieve breakthrough scientific advances, it takes an army. And in this case, we have an army with a lot of specialized expertise, um, including uh, Byron Carnes in mussel conservation. I study fisheries and river ecology, Greg Cope and Teresa Newton, study muscle ecology and aquatic toxicology. Ryan Heisey and Rob Nichols are uh, our state wildlife uh, agency biologists that specialize in fish ecology and muscle ecology. Ashton Drew 
is uh, works on expert opinion, Bayesian belief networks, and has done a lot of the modeling um, for this. And Joe DeReo and Jared Bales are hydrologists that model those components of our project. And Tom Augsburger has great insight with regard to how to apply these results to the policy and management arenas. And then um, that's a lot of people with high-level degrees. And then we had three really uh, ambitious, hardworking graduate students, Tamara Pandolfo, Jennifer Archambault, and Alyssa Ganser. And uh, Tamara and Jennifer are at NC State, and Alyssa is at UW La Crosse. Well, what kind of barriers am I talking about when I'm talking about breaking them? And, and I really mean spatial, organizational, political, and conceptual barriers. Um, we often sort of sort of find our own little comfort zone to conduct research and to study conservation and ecology. And um, we tend to stay close to home in those, those studies and developing them. We like to stay in our own states quite a bit. Sometimes the research is funded by a state agency, and it makes sense to conduct the bulk of the research in that state. But really, you might argue that we can learn more with broad spatial scales. And then we also went to school and we earned a degree in a specialized um, expertise in a topic and did, did even more specialized thesis research. And we like to stick in that general area, but you might argue you can learn more by spreading out there into biology, genetics, or toxicology fields related to your specific expertise. We study multiple taxa, and uh, we uh, might be resistant to some quantitative rigor to modeling approaches or adaptive management or structured decision making. And uh, we also tend to stay within our political comfort zone in academia, in our state or federal agency, or working in an NGO. And then finally, we're often stuck in our conceptual model, whether that be some niche in spatial, temporal, or organizational scale, or um, some other of the above uh, categories I've been talking about. And uh, so finally, I'd like to just, uh, we're going to present some modeling results today, and, and I think that we don't have to get so focused on, are these models predictive, are they realistic? Um, can we precisely predict the future with these models? And I just don't think of them that way, and I don't think that was the goal of our group. Our goal was to use these modeling exercises to learn about dynamic processes and general magnitudes and directions of impacts we might expect to see. So thinking about conceptual scale, it can range from fine to broad, static to dynamic, simple to complex, and in the spatial regime, that means working anywhere in between from microhabitats to landscape levels. For temporal, working in the current time scale to, through the historic or static and dynamic modeling. Organizational, we might be most comfortable studying just a population, but expand that out to the community or the ecosystem. And then I think we often learn more by looking at rate functions rather than static functions of a population. So things like production rate, growth rate, mortality over time might be more important than density or biomass of a population at any one time. And inarguably, if we want to look at broad scale complex things like climate and landscape changes, we're going to have to delve into some of these more challenging aspects of research. So global change is going on um, in virtually every country, every state, and stream ecologists have long known that what goes on up on the land affects what happens in the water. And in particular, things that we do up on the watershed can change the water quality, the water temperature, and the physical habitat for aquatic biota. And um, we're also greatly affected by climate change, of course, because things that happen up on the watershed can work synergistically to change temperature and habitat conditions in, in the stream environment. 
And so the two primary aspects of climate change that we're interested in are changes in air temperature, which lead to changes in water temperature, as well as changes in precipitation and stream discharge. And it's pretty undeniable here around North Carolina that we've got some serious climate change issues. This is a photo uh, screenshot that my collaborator Greg Cope took off his television watching the local news in Raleigh and uh, found a 158 degree uh, microclimate in Lewisburg. And uh, needless to say, real estate prices have dropped. There are economic impacts to climate change. Well, the animal that we studied and modeled are freshwater mussels of the family Unionidae. And, and just for a little background, freshwater mussels, mussels are long-lived, benthic, and sedentary animals. They're among the most rapidly declining faunal groups globally. And, and to our knowledge, 70% of North America's freshwater mussel species are classified as imperiled or extinct. They're fragmented throughout the landscape in patchy distributions, which limits the ability for extirpated populations to recolonize. And we know from our lab work at North Carolina State University, uh, published by Pan Tamara Pandolfo in 2010, that some of the species of freshwater mussels are living very close to their upper thermal limits. And that we've observed over time through Heather Galbraith's research and some data I'll present to you today that um, the assemblage shifts seem to be to more thermally tolerant species over time. Well, mussels are uh, a, great, a great animal to study for looking at global change effects. Um, they integrate so many aspects of the aquatic environment, and they have a complex life cycle that starts with the adult in, adults in the bottom of the stream or water body. They spawn and release glochidia, and uh, glochidia are a parasitic stage of freshwater mussels that are expelled um, toward fish hosts and they attach to their gills or fins where they'll incubate for several weeks and then drop off into the stream sediment. Uh, this, this can serve certainly as a dispersal mechanism for a rather sessile organism. And mussels have very creative ways of attracting fish to them, including um, these lures that they develop with their mantles that are pictured in some of the photos here. Well, we've been interested in this for a long time and developed a collaborative project that we entitled Modeling the Responses of Imperiled Freshwater Mussels to Anthropogenically Induced Changes in Water Temperature, Habitat, and Flow in the Streams of the Southeastern and Central United States. And our primary objective was to apply new mussel risk threshold data in downscaled watershed and in-stream regional models to forecast species responses to climate change and to and to begin to develop some adaptation strategies to mitigate those effects. And we're funded by, by two grants uh, from Department of Interior, one from the USGS National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center, and one from the Fish and Wildlife Service through our South Atlantic Landscape Conservation Cooperative here in Raleigh. Now I'm just going to show you a little flow diagram about, about the conceptual way uh, we initiated this research and, and more or less the way our data and procedures have flown. Um, first, we start off with generalized circulation models for climate predictions, and we downscale them to the local watersheds we're studying. Then we include some landscape dynamics and some temperature dynamics. We use air temperature as a surrogate for stream temperature and then model model that relationship through regression. Then develop some initial regional mussel occupancy models where, where we will find any certain species of mussel at any certain time. And occupancy modeling also includes a detection probability when you're working out in the field. So we used existing mussel thermal tolerance data that we had collected in previous research and incorporated that into the occupancy models. Then we went out into the field and our lab here in North Carolina and Wisconsin and um, did some field measurements on 
muscle occurrence and their habitat suitabilities and relationships and some lab measurements on thermal thresholds and looking at physiological and sublethal traits that might be affected by water temperature. Then we incorporate these results into refined regional muscle occupancy models and develop regional climate change response projections. And we can fine tune these by looking at historical muscle, muscle trends and doing some validity and sensitivity analyses. So we had research objectives in the laboratory to determine muscle thermal tolerance and looking at sublethal behavioral traits as well as uh, acute mortality of different temperatures. So we went in the field and we surveyed mussels and fish and we measured various uh, habitat parameters out in the field at multiple scales, uh, microhabitat, macrohabitat, and up on the watershed, and measured temperature in stream and in the sediment where mussels occur. Then we put some of this information together into modeling and analyses by, by looking at historical community analyses in the Mississippi River and developing hydrological and thermal models in the Tar River that would incorporate climate change and land use projections, then developed occupancy models and looked at the factors that uh, would affect occupancy of various mussels in a stream network, and brought this all together in the context of global change. So I'd like to start off by sharing some lab results, and I'm going to apologize that really each of these categories could could be a one-hour seminar, and I'm going to give you some highlights of, of things that we found and, and thought you'd be interested in. Lissa Gansner's thesis at UW La Crosse was to look at physiological traits of muscles rather than just acute, acute lethality of different temperatures. And so she studied the effects on juvenile muscles of elevated water temperature and looked at their survival, their heart rate, and their growth rate doing 28-day exposures of juvenile mussels of three species. And in terms of survival, and let me just very briefly explain that an LT50 is, is the lethal temperature that under which 50% of the test organisms die in uh, exposures. And in this case, it's a 28-day exposure. So for example, Lampsilis abrupta 50% of the animals over a 28-day period died at, at temperatures of 27 degrees Celsius. The LTO5 is a similar measure of lethality, and it's the temperature at which 5% of the organisms die during the 28-day exposure. And we, of course, see that uh, LTO5s are more conservative, lower numbers than the LT50s, and in general, an LT50 for these juveniles over 28 days range from 27 to 30 degrees. Then we went on and looked at some of the physiological traits as related to temperature. And heart rate is generally considered a measure of metabolic rate of an animal, especially cold-blooded animal. And uh, we found significant temperature effects in two of the three species. And if you think about poikilotherms, in theory, as the water temperature increases for them, their metabolism and heart rate should increase. But that's only up to a certain threshold of their optimum and then begins to decline after that. So we noticed a heart rate declining with temperature as an adaptation to, conservation, to conserve their energy under thermal stress conditions. And these temperatures that Alyssa was testing here are very commonly found in, in the Midwest and eastern U.S. streams where these mussels are abundant. She then went on and looked at some adult physiology doing 21-day exposures in sand and fed the, fed the mussels daily with endpoints measured weekly and had high survival among the various temperatures but found significant temperature effects in oxygen consumption, nitrogen excretion, and the condition index at the end of the study for these animals. And back here in North Carolina, um, Jennifer Archambault went to work in the lab and designed various exposure protocols um, to look at 
24-hour acute exposures for glochidia, the parasitic larval stage of mussels, and 96-hour exposures for juveniles. And survival were the endpoints here. And she also wanted to examine how we could make these laboratory exposures a little bit more ecologically realistic. And the ASTM standard test for looking at toxicity or thermal lethality in freshwater mussels is a water-only test, meaning there's no substrate. And of course, mussels are really tied to the substrate. And so we developed a test that we compared to water-only tests with sediment in the bottom of the chamber, and also to simulate a low water and dewatered flow regime, we had various, we had a higher and a lower amount of water in the beakers with the sediment. Jennifer also designed a, a very novel uh, laboratory mesocosm to look at thermal gradient, a vertical thermal gradient that is very, very commonly occurs in the stream environment where the water in in the substrate below the surface of the water is much cooler by several degrees than the surface water flowing over it. And that might serve as a thermal refuge for freshwater mussels during times of high water temperature. So Jennifer designed this apparatus that's pictured here with an upper, an upper aqueous uh, stratum where the temperature was kept rather warm and then a lower stratum where the temperature was held cooler by three to five degrees, and an intermediate stratum of styrofoam that served as a transition zone that was about two degrees uh, cooler than the surface water. And we hypothesized that juvenile mussels might burrow um, down to the cooler water if given the opportunity. Well, these are some of Jennifer's thermal tolerance data, and, and uh, she conducted tests with water only on glochidia, water only on juveniles, low water with juveniles, and dewatered juveniles, and with and without sediment. And in general, she found a great deal of overlap among these tests, and very similar results um, between life stages, the glochidia versus the juveniles, she found similar results between common and imperiled mussel species, similar results between Atlantic slope and interior basin species, and between her water only and her sediment tests, very similar results that were repeatable. And uh, between the low water and dewater tests to simulate changes in flow regime, she also found similar results. This was pretty surprising to us. She then went on to look at some sublethal measures of stress and uh, looked at two behaviors, burrowing into the sediment and as well as byssus production. And byssus is the material that mussels produce, particularly juveniles, uh, as an attachment mechanism. Um, and they're byssal threads that, that are easily uh, able to be seen um, in these tests that Jennifer was doing in the laboratory. And she found pretty distinct thermal effects of burrowing that fewer mussels burrowed at, at higher temperatures and fewer uh, mussels produced byssus as well. And that was true in low water and dewater treatments. And here are the results for the byssus where if you, if you we had uh, with warming water temperatures for a change per degree in byssus production of 18% to 35% among species. And then the flow regi regime treatment, um, low water or dewatered, also had a pretty significant effect um, in terms of byssus production. Uh, the low water, we found less byssus production than we did in, in, in high water. So um, then we went on to her vertical gradient experiments, and to our surprise, the, mus the mussels did not burrow. We found similar effects of temperature in terms of low water, dewater, in terms of thermal grade, in terms of t 
temperature lethality in terms of byssus production, but no muscles burrowed to speak of beyond the top two and a half centimeters. So we were unable to really elucidate that effect. And uh, but we were able to use this this mesocosm to look at effects of temperature, flow, and acclimation. And uh, we're we're still um, not giving up on this approach and looking at other sediment sizes and such. So to summarize our lab findings, we found significant glochidia and juvenile mortality at environmentally relevant temperatures. Juveniles and adults were physiologically sensitive to temperature in terms of physiological traits. Juveniles were behaviorally sensitive to temperature in terms of byssus production and burrowing, and that lab testing approaches really yield similar results with sediment, without sediment, low water, dewatered, and uh, in terms of acute mortalities, as well as the thermal, thermal gradient exposures. Well, now we're moving on to the field to uh, collect some real data, empirical data. And we studied two different watersheds. First, the St. Croix and Upper Mississippi Rivers in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin and Minnesota. There were eight sites, and Teresa and Byron Carnes led the field collections there. And the Upper Tar River Basin in North Carolina. It's a Piedmont and Coastal Plain uh, warm water stream system. So the first thing we did was conduct mussel surveys at sites in, in the Tar River and uh, at 20 different sites. We spent at least six person hours minimum in snorkel and tactile surveys. And then we went to these same stream reaches and in a 200 meter reach we sampled fish using two backpack electrofishers and used a pretty much standardized multi-pass procedure. And of course, um, the significance of the fish in our studies is really to serve as mussel hosts and dispersal mechanisms. And many of these mussels are very specific in the hosts that they can use um, to, to uh, incubate their glochidia. We also collected uh, in-stream habitat data, microhabitat measurements throughout the stream, as well as macrohabitat uh, measurements of the reach. And temperature was so important in, in this research to model changes in climate change that um, we developed uh, what we thought was novel at the time, um, uh, temperature recorders that would measure temperature with an eye button in the water column, 10 centimeters above the epibenthic area, um, down in the sediment, five centimeters below the sediment water interface, and then even deeper than that, 15 centimeters. And we hypothesized that that would serve as a thermal buffer, and we wanted to quantify those effects directly in the field. Um, ab about a year after we had developed these for our streams, we saw that they're commercially available now, and, uh, but um, they're not all that cheap to purchase. But uh, we found the ones that we built worked really very well. So, so as we suspected, uh, we did find that uh, sediment functions as a thermal buffer for mussels, and especially the juveniles. And uh, this, this, these are data that you're looking at are from the uh, St. Croix and Upper Miss up in Wisconsin. And we found temperatures usually vary down into the sediment by about three degrees centigrade from that in the water column. But at one site um, in the Mississippi, they vary by as much as seven degrees cooler. And we found similar results in the Tar River Basin in North Carolina as well. Um, the green is the, is, uh, 15 centimeters below the water surface, the uh, sediment water interface. And you can see that during the summer warm months, the water is much cooler below the sediment. During fall, it becomes pretty similar. And then during the winter, the water under the sediment is, um, is actually warmer. And we found pretty similar magnitudes in the Tar River as to that in the upper mist. So then we wanted to do some modeling of all this. Um, and the first thing that we wanted to look at was a comparison of historical 
mussel assemblages in the upper Mississippi River relative to that of today. And Teresa and Byron were fortunate to have some historical data and recent surveys then that they had conducted for comparison. And, and in general, we found the more thermally tolerant species became more abundant over time, and the thermally sensitive species tended to become less abundant in that river system. And, and this might be considered rather anecdotal because there are a lot of confounding factors, of course, between 1920 and uh, more recent surveys. But I do think uh, that it's pretty indicative of a trend um, that we should be on the lookout for. <clears throat> well, then we developed some watershed models for the Tar River Basin in North Carolina. And we had 20 different sub-watersheds uh, that we modeled. And with our, we had uh, temperature loggers in each of those. And um, all the field data that we collected in terms of in-stream habitat suitability uh, parameters, as well as a good deal of information available um, through existing GIS layers. And Joe DeRao and Jared Bales are the hydrologists on the project. And they were able to develop discharge models based on in-stream flow data that we collected, uh, USGS gauges, um, the topography and geography of the watershed, as well as land use patterns and uh, geomorphology within the stream. And that what I'm showing you here are uh, mean discharges oh, over um, a multi-year period. And the dots are actual data and the red lines are simulated data. So they did a pretty good job of being able to model the uh, flow patterns uh, with some pretty good precision. The next thing they did was to model temperature data. This is also observed and simulated and uh, had some, some pretty tight-fitting models there as well. And of course, we were most interested in the warm months of the year in developing these models. And these included historical data as well as the data that Tamara Pandolfo and others uh, in North Carolina collected out in the field. So the, the next step in the temperature modeling, which was very important for looking at exceedance rates, was to develop hourly temperature models for different sites in the stream. And even I was very surprised myself at an hourly time scale we were able to pretty pretty well um, match simulated and observed uh, patterns in the thermal environment. And Jared and Joe have validated these with an independent data set, and the fit is really equally well um, with a new data set. So now we had hourly temperature data in these streams during the warmest time of the year, and we could estimate the exceedances where freshwater mussels might be reaching or exceeding their thermal limits. And here's an hourly threshold exceedance frequency. So it's the number of times that um, a fraction of hours is exceeded in temperature. And so if we start to the left, uh, temperatures of 25 degrees, and these include observed and simulated, are exceeded um, at a rate of anywhere between 15 and 25 percent. And as you get warmer and warmer, uh, less and less exceedance values. And so, for example, um, the 30 degree centigrade exceedance value is, um, is just a percent or so, and that is the lethal temperature, the LT50, for juvenile muscles over a 28-day period. And so you can see that, that uh, for example, the 28-day LT05, or 5% of the exposed animals are expected to suffer mortality, um, is exceeded pretty frequently for, for um, Lockheedian juveniles there, juveniles. So let's look at some numbers related to this uh, in terms of threshold exceedances directly applicable to the freshwater mussels. So the juvenile LT50 for 96 hours 
is about 34 degrees Celsius, and that was not exceeded in any projections into the future up to the conditions for the year 2060. But if we look at the 32 degrees centigrade temperature, which is an LT50 for muscle glycidia over a 24-hour period, in the year 2030, we would expect these temp that temperature to be exceeded 15% of the time. And in fact, um, that, that proportion doubles um, in 30-year increments later. And then even cooler temperatures, juvenile LTO5s for 96 hours at 30 degrees are exceeded anywhere from 28 to 52 percent um, between 2030 and 2060. And then glochidia LTO5s, a very conservative 24-hour test, shows, um, shows exceedances 81 percent of the time in 2013 and slightly higher in 2060. So we can see that we're really not that far from having a pretty serious uh, temperature effect if uh, global climate predictions uh, do materialize. And the temperatures we're talking about between 30 and 35 are really not that unusual. This is a screenshot of real-time water temperatures from July of 2012, and of course that was one of the hottest, hottest uh, Julys in history. But we see very common uh, exceedances over 30 degrees and even over 35 degrees in the eastern and southern United States and Caribbean where a lot of these mussel um, species occur, especially some imperiled mussels. Well, the next thing we did was put all this information together in occupancy models. And uh, we did that for five species, and this is part of Tamara Pandolfo's dissertation work at NC State. And we looked at various covariates to model detection probabilities as well as actual occupancy, the presence or absence of a species at a particular site. And we looked at things that are related to muscle dispersal, habitat, channel morphology, the fish hosts, things that might affect their food and water quality like land use and cover, and of course temperature because we're very interested in the climate change and temperature increases related to land use change. And, and we were not surprised by the uh, model selection uh, criteria and the covariates that were deemed the most parsimonious to explain detection probability and those are typical things at the microhabitat level. So the type of substrate in the habitat greatly affects our ability to detect a mussel species if it is, in fact, in, in the stream reach where we're searching, as well as the physical cover in the stream and the water velocity. And so these, these came out really pretty much as expected. Um, what maybe was not so expected was the occupancy probability covariates. And essentially, we found in various models for different species that all of these ecological functions um, came out as the parameters associated with them came out as significant explanatory variables for estimating occupancy probability of freshwater mussels. So it really does seem to be an integrated habitat suitability type of system that we're looking at here. And it did, in, in, and it did of course, include um, the thermal environments as well. Well, now um, that we had the occupancy models, we also had a number of species that are so rare in the environment that are that are federally endangered and and highly threatened, such as the Tar River spiny mussel, which is pictured here on the left of the screen. Um, that kind of animal is very hard to go out and collect empirical data data for and to model it that way. So Ashton Drew um, is is our expert modeler for um, eliciting expert knowledge and, and incorporating that into different uh, modeling scenarios. And so she uh, had conducted several design workshops with local mu mussel experts and national experts and um, did some data collection in the field as well. And developed prediction elicitations, and then developed a Bayesian belief network 
and uh, then went on finally to verify and validate those those data and those projections on what is suitable habitat for imperiled species like the Tar River spiny mussel. So it varies. This model incorporates both qualitative no knowledge from the experts as well as quantitative knowledge that we then went out in the field to collect and validate. And then finally, um, really the ultimate end product for, for our agencies is is um, a decision support tool. And this includes uh, data that uh, from the landscape level, GIS type data, and including occupancy data, and then field data that we collected as well, including occupancy data in terms of mussels occurring there. The GIS data is the probability of suitable habitat being at any one um, site in a drainage network. And uh, when we put all this information together, we can come up with various management and conservation scenarios ranging from no action, restoring habitat, translocating or reintroducing populations, releasing captive bred mussels, and in the situation where the habitat is already occupied, protection strategies. And I think this is going to be a very useful tool and uh, one of our objectives is that uh, it might become a model that could apply in other areas. Uh, right now, Ashton is uh, finalizing this, and we're doing some, still this summer, some uh, validation field surveys uh, to refine those models. So uh, back to all our research objectives. Finally, we want to put this together into a synthesis toward global change, and uh, we're, we've got several papers right now submitted to journals and uh, hope to bring it all together in, in one large summary paper. So were we successful in breaking traditional barriers? And I think in this case, I'd like to say we were, that we did really abandon those professional comfort zones. Um, we went uh, outside of our local state and region, and we spanned between the upper Midwest and the eastern seaboard. We included um, modeling and empirical information beyond just ecology and conservation, including animal biology, uh, stream hydrology, and aquatic toxicology. We looked at multiple taxa, multiple life stages, um, certainly <clears throat> had the quantitative rigor that we sought using Bayesian belief networks, adaptive resource management, and structured decision making. And uh, the politics I thought was pretty good. We spanned academia and agencies, both at state and federal level, and developed uh, conceptual models that integrate among scales, I think. And really do believe that so far we've learned a lot from these modeling exercises, and uh, we hope to continue this line of research and expand it and uh, hopefully um, develop some models for other that could be applied elsewhere uh, in the U.S. And uh, with that, I'd be glad to address any questions that I might, but also uh, many of the collaborators whose work we've highlighted here are online as well. And uh, if there's a specific question that they might address, uh, better than me, then they'll be online and be able to do that. So um, thank you all for your attention, and uh, thanks again to Holly, Emily, and Ashton, and uh, Ashley for hosting, and uh, be glad to answer any questions or entertain some discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, we already are getting some in the chat box. You can either use the chat box or you can press the raise hand icon that's located between the participant list and the chat box. Uh, once you press that, I will see your hand raise. Um, actually, Tom, can you bring us back by pressing the stop button to the home page? Mm -hmm. The stop that, button I, on. I think I just did that. You're not seeing it? Mm. No. Can you? Are you in full screen right now? No. I can go let me go back to full screen and try. 
Perfect. Awesome. Did that do it? Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Might have just been my computer. <laughs> um, so, yes, if you want to ask a question, you can press the raise hand icon that's located between the participant list and the chat box. Uh, I will see your hand raised. I will call on you by name. And then you're going to want to take off the mute off your own phone if it's on. And then you're also going to want to move the global mute by pressing star six. All right, on to the first question from Matt Patterson. He says, you mentioned strategies for mitigation. Are there any ideas out there on how to mitigate for climate change when it comes to mussels? Well, um, I'll answer that and then I'll open it up, up to my collaborators. But in general, um, we find land, land use and things that we do on the watershed, how we manage the land to to really be sort of synergistic with climate change, that as, as we um, create more urbanized watersheds, as we have direct runoff going in, as uh, we clear the forest canopy along streams, that really has a, a general warming effect on our surface waters. And so while, while in a regional or a local scale, we don't have much much of um, an opportunity to control climate change or, or any warming, but we do have the chance to do some land use planning that uh, could have a mitigating effect. And, and that's the primary um, uh, approach that, that comes to mind to me. Um, I, I did with a colleague, Jim Peterson, some uh, modeling of a Midwestern River where we showed that if we return the, the land use patterns on the watershed of the Kankakee River in Illinois to their historical uh, state, that we could pretty much mitigate totally for climate change to the year 2060 or so. Anybody else, uh, Joe, or anybody else a comment on that, Teresa, Greg? I guess they're letting me handle that one. Thanks for that question. Okay, do we have any more questions? Yes. From Daylin, I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, it says, you referenced 2030 and 2060s as predictions for climate change temperatures changes in time frame. Are these IPCC data you used or something else? From your perspective, what are the best models for future predictions? Um, well, I'm very, I could answer that question pretty generally and then probably uh, Joe DeReo uh, or Tamara Pandolfo might be able to answer um, more more specifically, but yeah, th those are IPC, IPCC data, but there are other uh, general circulation models available that recently have been downscaled, and, and USGS has just um, put together a big effort through Catherine Hayhoe and the Wildlife and Climate Science Centers in Reston um, to downscale many of those circulation models for the entire country. And uh, 2030, 2060 were just um, various endpoints for IPCC data. And and then I'm going to ask Joe DeReo if he has anything to add to that. Joe, are you out there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, we we actually did use the downscale data from, from HAYHOE. And, th and those, those are uh, downscale you know, general circulation models. Uh, one of the, one of the issues with those models is they don't tend to simulate extreme events very well. Um, there are other options, and, and there are other options to use regional, um, regionally downscaled models, uh, which I don't know what's available for the southeast. But right now, I'm in I'm in uh, in New Jersey now, and there are some models regionally downscaled models which tend to be a little bit more uh, accurate when it comes to extreme events. So. And, and other other um, one aspect that we did not include in our models was specifically extreme events. So so the analysis could be extended 
um, for ex extreme the increase in frequency of extreme events, which is a likely consequence of climate change, that we'd get more larger events and that more rainfall would and the, a great proportion of, of the rainfall would come from heavy events, which would have an impact on stream flow, absolute, uh, in particular, but also stream temperature. We n did not do that, but there, there, there are there are data available, and there are models that can do that. So, hopefully, you get that modeled before the next uh, Hurricane Sandy-like event. Yes. There, Joe. <laughs> yes. I'm I'm working on it now, Ashley. All right. Is there another question, Ashley? Yes, um, there's one from Dan Howes. I'd like to know if you tried other spatial models to do analysis. Other spatial models? Tamara or Joe, any ideas on that? In, in what, in, for, for what, for the... For, uh, the hydrologic modeling or the, the occupancy modeling, Dan, what are you thinking about? It says Maxton and RF. Maxton. Oh, we did. Joe, you did not use Maxton at all. Um, no. Uh, Ashton, are you on there? I think he's talking about the uh, the decision support tools also. I. This is Ashton. I am on. I did not use Maxton because um, we don't have enough presence data for. There's only three sites. So really with the Tar River spiny muscle. <laughs> yeah, one one difficulty that we had is um our emphasis is on the imperiled mussels and and they're variably less abundant than the more common mussels and and so for example, um Tamara had uh um occupancy information uh at these 20 sites and these subwater sheds in the Tar River basin. And and some of the species, like the dwarf wedge mussel, are in certain habitats, whereas the tar spiny river is so rare that um, you you might collect one a year if you scour the river very well. And then we have really common species like Elliptio complanata that were at every site. So it's not a very interesting occupancy model when the mussel is pretty much ubiquitous through your watershed. Any other questions? Thanks, Tom. Did, Dan, did we answer your question? Did they hit on it? And, I'll, and while we're waiting for Dan to respond, we have one from Teresa Tom. It says, have you, will you consider examining genetic variability of mussel species and populations as a next step in evaluating resilience of various mussel species to various impacts from climate change. Oh, I think think that's just a great suggestion, and and um, I collaborate pretty frequently with Greg Cope when when we do muscle work because that's really his expertise, and and uh, we've been talking to a geneticist um, here at NC State, Martha Reiskin, about um, using various various genetic tools to sort of get it at just that thing, um, resiliency and uh, effective population sizes and, and things like that. And in fact, we're interested in, in doing some transplant, reciprocal transplant experiments as well, um, where we would use a common genetic stock. So yeah, I, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, I'll, I'll bet a dollar that other people are already doing it. And, and that's one of the things we're sort of seeking funding to do um, as a next step. Teresa, anything um, over in Wisconsin in terms of the genetics? Um, not at this time, although we also have been, you know, putting a few feelers out to see what might what might be out there and what the interest is. Yeah, I think um, the the molecular tools that have become less expensive, less costly and more precise to use are just opening up all kinds of, of possibilities for people studying conservation of in, in imperiled species. Thank you. Uh, we have a, 
Another question from Matt Patterson. It says, do you know if there are thermal tolerances for the glucidal attachment to the fish host? Geez, I'm going to bet uh, Greg Coper, Tamara Pandolfo will know that because because um, they're going to have to say what happens to glochidia that are attached to a fish and then their thermal tolerance uh, is reached. Do Greg or Tamara or Teresa have an answer to that? That's a great question, and, and we did not specifically um, study glochidia on fish but um, I bet those folks are well-read enough to answer that question. Greg, yeah. come on. Um, Tamara's on Tamara. board. She's going to address it. <laughs> right. uh, as, as you said, we didn't do that um, ourselves for this project, but I think there's a couple of uh, references out there where that's been done. Um, we can't remember the citations exactly, but maybe out of um, Chris Barnhart's lab or Dick Nev's lab, I think they might have done a few a few species of work. I know I don't think it's been done extensively, but um, there's a little bit of information out there. That is correct. It's it's not very extensive. In fact, the 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 life stage glochidia um, once it's insisted on the host fish, uh, there's very little information uh, for thermal sensitivity, but in particular, very little information on toxicant and other kinds of exposures that might happen while the glochidia are are attached or insisted on the on the tissues of the host fish. And so I think it's a very good question and one that deserves uh, a lot more attention. And uh, related to that, uh, Tamara, Greg, and I just published a paper in Walk Arena, the Journal of the Freshwater Mollusk Conservation Society, that compared thermal tolerances of freshwater mussel species to their specific fish hosts. And we found in general that um, the thermal tolerance of the fish host can be more of a liability, more stenothermic than that of the mussel itself. So that further adds another sort of complex constraint because of their parasitic life cycle. Anything else, Ashley? I'm just scrolling through. They said, is the, oh, you just answered it. If the decision support tool is available and will it be? I think you just said that. Um, Ashton, you want to talk about that? Actually, that is still sort of being developed. Uh, that our climate change uh, grant from the USGS um, has just terminated, and, and we have some products that will soon be available from that, but our funding from the Fish and Wildlife Service South Atlantic LCC is um, still active and we're sort of toward the tail end of that. And Ashton, any projection yeah. on that tool might be available as a model? I think our final products are due in December, is that the end of the year, is that correct? Yeah, the, I guess the funding's up yeah. in September and December I mean, for the have final to products. It'll be whatever has to go through review and everything as well, <laughs> which I've learned takes a while with USGS stuff. But um. yeah, so we'll do some fundamental science practices review on that, and I would say next spring or so, Ashton. Yeah, sure. However long that review would take, I know that. I mean, I'm assuming that what I have to turn in is in is the December a final product um, and working towards that goal. So it won't be a to make it clear. It won't be a pretty GUI interface um, sort of decision support tool. It would just be the having developed the method for how it works and sort of run it once. But there's no reason people couldn't pick that up in, in right, other no. areas and use it as a model. Yep. Yeah, that's the use idea. It as a model to develop their own model, I guess, is what I'm trying Correct. to say. Correct. Yeah. No, it's being developed as sort of a general approach using the Tar River spiny mussel as an example, but with where the the variables that are included are things that we expect mussels in general to, like in, when you showed the occupancy, the list of variables that were in the occupancy and detection models, those kinds of things, um, that those are the sorts of things that might matter to various mussel species, but matter to them differently. So the threshold levels could be changed for various components of the model 
um, a specific target level if you were looking like for the temperature target or the substrate targets could be changed. Um, but you'd be inputting the same spatial data, assuming you had it. And we've tried to go mostly with national data products feeding in so that those would be things that other people would have access to. Thanks, Ashton. Mm -hmm. Is there any, Ashley, how long how long do we have this line? Oh, uh, we had it for another half an hour. Oh, okay. Oh, and right. um, we do have one more question from Leroy Coach. Leroy, you can ask your question. You uh, can you hear me? This is Leroy. Yes. Yep. Okay. Good. I uh, couldn't figure out how to do the chat thing, so. So I better raise my hand. This is a, an extremely interesting uh, presentation. I really appreciate this. There's all kinds of things that I'm kind of thinking about. But on a real, you know, practical basis, I, I'm thinking that, you know, thermal tolerances with various species of muscles. I mean, we're, we're probably already maybe seeing some of this. I'm, I'm, I don't really have a question per se, other than just some comments that at least here in Kentucky, uh, in the Green River, which is one of our best rivers in the in the state for uh, mussel diversity and all that, it seems to be also an area that uh, is very uh, karsty and has a lot of uh, uh, springs that enter into the into the uh, into the river, which have, I think could be assumed that kind of help keep the temperatures a little bit cooler, perhaps. And uh just wondering if there is any you know, any folks out there that are looking at, at you know, from a practical uh, standpoint of managing mussels and keeping uh you know, certain species, finding the best rivers and streams in which we can do, you know, augmentations and transplantations and all that. Uh, you know, do we need to start thinking about you know, picking out areas in the in the country rivers that are maybe going to be better suited to and less apt to uh, uh, be affected by temperature change because of you know maybe influences like you know springs and you know upwellings or whatever. It's uh, kind of kind of interesting. I I know some work that we're doing up in Ohio in Kilbuck Creek with the purple cat's paw mussel. Uh, which is the only place that they're known to occur at this point in time. Uh, we've been having uh, some search efforts for that species for since 2006, and last year was the most successful in which we found some females and, and males. But it just so happened that uh, one of the areas in which most of those were being re observed was in an area where the uh, uh, um, uh, mussel uh, searcher was noticing some real cool water coming up out of the, the river bottom, and I just wonder if uh, anybody else has been noticing around the country where there seems to be, you know, maybe a, a cooler spot in the river in which some of these mussels are perhaps still uh, clinging on. It just in this particular case, in Killbuck, it's one of the epioblasmas, which of course are almost all extinct, but i just open it up for discussion, see if anybody has anything to say, just an observation more than anything else. Well, Leroy, I think that that's a that's a great observation. I th I think it's uh, I wouldn't say it's common, but I think other people have observed that that groundwater inputs are extremely important for for especially it seems like the imperiled mussels. I um, think that's true for the tar spiny, and um, it's a, and it's even more important in sort of karst geology areas like you're talking about. But it's it's important also for us um, here in the Piedmont and, and uh, the coastal plain. And Joe had talked about doing some specific modeling that might get at that, like looking at gradient and stream incision and uh, what might be sort of uh, some hot spots for groundwater upwelling or seeps. And, and with regard to your other question, and I'll let Joe talk in a second, um, I th I think identifying potential refugia <clears throat> is is a real important application of the kind of research we're doing here. But we're generally working within within a drainage area and within a watershed, and 
uh, river basin, and I wonder if the day is going to come where we might have to look outside the native river, river basin to establish populations, um, you know, rather than lose a species altogether or bringing them into captivity alone. I, uh, it's, it's kind of a big, interesting question. Joe, do you have, uh, I just remember a conversation with you when we were talking about modeling upwelling in groundwater and that there were some landscape variables that you might be able to relate to it. Is that true? Uh, yeah, it is. I, it's actually it's one of the things that, that I'm I'm working on some of my, one of my proposals that I have out is to look at uh, to get some temperatures deeper than what, what we had in the Tar River for temperature loggers to see if we've got uh, incoming groundwater from below and, and uh, but it's it's really really important for um, stream temperature modeling and and I I think that finding areas that are more stable because of groundwater influx might be a good way to actually maybe you know find good better habitat so I had been thinking about using it the, the modeling to kind of maybe um, be able to locate locate areas uh, with better with more uh, stable temperatures, or, or that might be better habitat for some species. Um, this, of course, the stuff I'm doing is not I don't I'm not a biologist, so it's most all the modeling. So that's just, but I do think there's a potential for modeling applications for, with that in that area. There is that potential, Leroy. This is Greg. Um, I, I think you're right on target with with that question and that point and that, you know, the I think it was borne out here, especially for the observations of the experts that Ashton interviewed for the Tar River Spiny Muscle work is that, you know, where they seem to be hanging on are these areas of, of groundwater interaction uh, in the stream bed and uh, and providing these localized refugia. And, and uh, from Joe's perspective, I think being able to detect those and, and, and model those and there are tools that um, that we know are available, and had some comments um, and discussions with with um, USGS Water Science uh, folks, and in, in being able to lay down and actually quantify within the stream bed uh, these areas of groundwater um, influence. So I think that is a, a really good point, and one we probably ought to pay more attention to in the future. And Leroy, this is Teresa. We've done that for the Upper Mist. We've uh, um, actually looked at groundwater inputs and overlaid that with distributional maps, and we found high degree of concurrence between where we see the dense and diverse assemblages of mussels, even in the Upper Mist, coincides nicely with where we see the um, the groundwater inputs as well. So, and the other thing I think people have to remember is, you know, mussels do have some behavioral adaptations in terms of vertical and horizontal movement to try to seek some of these thermal refugia even at a at a micro scale. I well, appreciate that conversation. It it opens up all kinds of, you know, questions on on management as to, you know, how we should uh select or try to, you know, work towards, you know, protecting uh and and being able to manage areas that may be will in the future see an increased important role in uh, maintaining, you know, certain certain species of mussels where, you know, if uh, can't spread them out everywhere, they may we may end up having them in just a few select areas where the temperatures are more stable. So, you know, lots lots of lots of uh, ways to look at this. It's real interesting. And then just that add-on, Shane Hallen said. Um, we have actually noticed abnormally cold water conditions in the karst influent streams during drought years, even with high ambient air temperatures. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. That's right. In, in karst areas, uh, I think uh, groundwater and surface water are really not, not two separate resources to be managed that way either. It's all more like And then could you just repeat that last part? There was some background noise. Well, it's in karst areas of the country where the water can percolate between the groundwater and the surface water pretty freely, 
Um, it seems like uh, in the U.S. we've always thought about managing groundwater and managing surface waters, but that doesn't hold true uh, very much in karst areas. Um, I spent some time in the Ozarks of Arkansas, and and much of the groundwater there that people used to use for for drinking water wells um, is polluted from a lot of the agricultural pollution from chicken industry and confined animal operations. And um, it's you know it's really. N n not the best way to think of managing your water resources in terms of two separate pools of water, especially in, in karsty areas where there's a lot of interchange. Thank you. And Dan was able to get back, and he's just wondering if you've ever tried the Maxent model. Uh, Ashton, are you still on? And we have not, but why not, Ashton? I'm still on. Um, just... <laughs> We, I mean, we, I've used Max, we've used MaxEnt in our research group for other projects. It's usually with um, presence-only data, and again, we don't have enough data points to really use MaxEnt for the super imperiled mussels. Um, and the sites are so different. I mean, it was even the same when we had experts together that there's not, they can be, if you only have three sites, you might have three different sediment types. Um, and one site appears to have groundwater, and one site appears not to. One site appears to have... Um, shelter from coarse woody debris where another has it from rocks, so it's just there at so few sites, it's really, you need to have some of those correlations for Maxent to, um, to work well. <laughs> Thanks, Ashton. Are there any more, Ashley? I'm not seeing any more. Do you have any closing remarks? Um, I don't, but I, uh, well, n nothing in particular other than I'd like to thank everybody for participating and uh, look forward to uh, others um, working in this, this line of research and hopefully we'll be doing some more and have some publications available and you can just, you know, check our respective websites uh, once in a while as well as the uh, National Wildlife and Climate Change um, website for this project for products as they become available. And uh, just thanks to everybody and, and to my collaborators as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, pretty interesting discuss discussion surrounding this. Um, a recording of this broadcast will be posted on the USGS uh, National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center website. Uh, it's shown on the screen there in the chat box. And um, all of them are there, actually, all of our previous webinars as well. So if you missed one, uh, it's a great resource to go back to. Our next webinar will be on April 11th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. This will be part one of a two-part series. Um, we have several speakers, Dr. Jonah Witter, University of Missouri, Craig Puckert, Missouri Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, Tyrell DeWeber, from Penn State University, and they'll be presenting on fish habitat and climate change, implications for the desert southwest uh, and midwestern smallmouth bass and eastern brook trout. So please stay tuned for announcement, uh, an announcement, and thank you again all for your participation. Sounds great, Ashley. Thank you.